everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today for uh, another session of uh, Truth Be Told with uh, Khalid Janahi. Uh, today, the uh, topic uh, that we will cover is uh, sovereign wealth funds and uh, SDGs. Uh, but uh, we will start uh, the discussion with uh, a few words uh, around uh, Lebanon and what is, what is happening there. So, um, uh, Khalid, uh, thank you for, for joining us once again. And so, first of all, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing how do you see beyond uh, the, the, the horrible uh, events that are happening, how do you see things moving forwards and, and what is your understanding of how things can change in Lebanon? Thank you very much, Khaled. I mean, uh, first and foremost, I mean, let me just uh, give my condolences uh, and thoughts to most of the people who passed away and who are still missing and injured in the country. Uh, I mean, the Beirutis, uh, they've been through so much. It looks like uh, uh, Lebanon as a whole, it's a cursed country, uh, at least for the past four decades. Um, and of course, Lebanon, as you know, and especially Beirut, is got a very special place in my heart because um, when I left home, Bahrain, the first place I went to in terms of studying was Beirut, American University of Beirut, which was uh, everyone who went there my time and before uh, recognizes that this was a beacon of culture, beacon of thought, beacon of so many good things in the Arab world. And when they used to call it the Palace of the East, I think that was an understatement of uh, what it's all about, Le Lebanon, and the way Lebanese have built it to where it is. Um, what happened on the 4th of August, and um, actually I was just hours after that, I had one of these, what I would call wise people on the phone, um, and saying that this reminded him of Cairo uh, before 26th of January 52 and after 26th of January 52, where 26th of January 52 was the great uh, fire of Cairo and how Cairo was before and what happened after. Of course, um, different people will look at it differently. Uh, some people will say it went to negative, some people will say it went to positive, but uh, keeping that aside, so what he was trying to say that Lebanon has to uh, now with what happened uh, with this tragedy uh, on the 4th of August, Lebanon has no option and the Lebanese people have no option but to really look forward and, and life has to change and the way we do things have to change. Um, it, it is shameful in some ways that after the event, everything, when you look at the social media and social media, there is good things about social media and there's the bad things about social media. This is part of the bad thing about social media that everybody just went into the conspiracy theory perspective rather than looking actually at what happened and the issues we're going to go forward with. I mean, this was, uh, with no, nobody can doubt that it was pure carelessness uh, the way and, and total lack of diligence. Uh, by whoever is in charge, whoever was looking after the place. So it's not just basically one party or two party or three party. Everybody is responsible for what happened. Um, and leaving Lebanon to where it is today, and the Lebanese and Lebanon and Beirut specifically, uh, and the, uh, the beacons of culture such an, and education such as AUB and others in, in Lebanon, are so important that if something like Lebanon becomes a failed state, then I would say the Arab world is, is a failed part of the world, totally. So we can't, as an Arab, uh, I would say we can't afford to see uh, Lebanon uh, going more on a downward spiral. Uh, and the expectation is that 50% before this COVID, issue we had 50% uh, uh, of the people under the poverty line in Lebanon and the expectation is after COVID is going to be over 60% and 65% and what with this tragedy and that is going to make it much worse now going forward I mean with so many 300,000 people reportedly 
basically have lost their homes. I mean, this, this is in today's day and age, in a place like Lebanon, where we at my, my generation, when we were young, we were looking up to Beirut and Lebanon to be the place, to be the example for, for all of us. And I believe, as it always has, actually, as Lebanese people have proved time and time that they can come out of this. And I'm hoping they will, and I'm sure they will. However, the road to the future is not going to be easy. We can blame everyone. Uh, but I think we'll just look at the mirror and blame ourselves. We can blame uh, a country which is financing someone, but I'm sorry to say all countries were financing individuals and parties rather than supporting truly the country because if they were supporting the country over the past 40 years, the country would not be in the situation it's in today. So things have to change and there should be no preconditions of any support and the Lebanese don't need it. Uh, I mean, it's one set of people that they don't need actually preconditionalities put on them. I mean, the only precondition should be, I mean, this is a country which was run for, for so many years without a government, but it was run by the people themselves. They knew how to manage things and deal with things without a government. So the people of Lebanon uh, will go through this and will come through this. So I think for now, rather than blaming here and blaming there, I think this is the time basically that we have all, all of us to be in solidarity with the people of Beirut and support it every which way we can, whether it's financially, and if we cannot do it financially, morally, we have to have support rather than just going into conspiracy theories and igniting issues like we've done in the past. I'm sorry, I mean, this is a subject in itself. It's a, it's an, a very important subject. And I think a lot of uh, people now are working on Lebanon to be the, the case, uh, the right case in the Arab world, either we go forward or we're all going to be basically failed. So I think uh, let's hope, and I'm hope, very hopeful. And I let's hope, let's and, hope for the let's hope for the best. Yeah, but but but, but I think I, I, one, I just one, want to one, let one, you know, Khaled, I launched a, a poll asking uh, the attendees uh, if they uh, want us to spend more time on. Uh, Lebanon today and to a majority of the two-thirds the answer was no they want us to stay on track with the the original topic yeah. I mean I have a lot to say about Lebanon and I will I will uh, I will uh, keep silent uh, so let's let's go back to our our, uh, our original topic which is the sovereign uh, wealth funds and uh, the sustainable development uh, goals um, I just want to, to mention to everybody that if somebody wants to ask a live question, voice, uh, they can raise their hand uh, at the second part of, the, of, our, of our meeting and we'll be able to uh, allow them to speak uh, and be heard and like this they can uh, ask you questions uh, directly. So I, I want to start with you. When we look at sovereign wealth funds and we know our region uh, is uh, home to uh, some of the largest sovereign wealth funds uh, uh, in the world. Uh, do you think that it should, in light of all the changes that are taking place, really look at uh, SDGs or should it have solely and uniquely a focus on uh, returns? And uh, I'll add another question. Can you uh, really integrate and, and, and have a strong SDG focus without today having a negative impact on your uh, returns. Uh, thank you very much, Khaled. Okay, I, I think before we dig into the SDG factor, let's just get a feel of the sovereign wealth funds. I mean, sovereign wealth fund suddenly uh, in the new millennia became a buzzword or buzz three letters that uh, uh, we had few before that, before the new millennia, and then suddenly we started getting more and more everybody wants to have a sovereign wealth fund to its name uh, as a country. Now, so, uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, the initial actually, and we as, fr from a Gulf perspective, uh, we should be proud that the first one actually really started all this was Kuwait Investment Authority, uh, which was started in the 50s, I think it was 55, uh, 1955. So it was in the last uh, century. Uh, and it, fo it was followed afterwards with the second one, which I think was 76, which was Adia. But 
when, when all this started, it started like this. I mean, it's two folds, uh, mainly for all the big ones that we have. We have either sovereign wealth funds, which are based on commodity, and mainly the commodity income perspective is basically oil and gas. And I think that is like the countries in the GCC, like uh, uh, Norway, Chile, and some other countries that we have, which are basically very much commodity-based uh, sovereign wealth funds. And then we have others which they have surplus foreign reserves uh, sovereign wealth funds. And th those are the Chinas of this world, the Singapores of this world, and some of the others like Korea and some of the others which are basically non-commodity, but uh, they are very much surplus uh, reserves that they had the foreign exchange money that they've been getting. And they basically created these sovereign wealth funds. Now, and then of course we have the hybrid. Yeah, few, which is mixed, but those are very, in, in reality, they are small in comparison. So we have sovereign wealth funds, okay? And we should differentiate sovereign wealth fund, okay? From the, what I would call uh, foreign exchange reserves, because th there is sort of a mixture like uh, Saudi uh, Monetary Authority, sometimes it's included, it's, must, it's reserves, it's included as a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, in reality, it's more, it's a foreign exchange reserve per se, uh, although it could be used, okay, it could be given to the sovereign wealth fund in terms of objectives and going forward and dealing with it in terms of uh, the future investments. So we have sovereign wealth funds, we have the foreign exchange reserves, and then we have actually the pension funds. Uh, now, between the three, I mean, the sovereign wealth fund on a global basis today, there are around 88 uh, sovereign wealth funds uh, across the globe. Uh, it's around the assets and the management range between eight and eight and a half trillion dollars today. And we have foreign exchange reserves, which are again ranging around 11.5 to 12 trillion dollars. And then we have the big one actually is the pension funds across the globe. Uh, which is around 18 trillion. Interestingly, the pen, out, out of that, when you look at it as numbers, say it's 40 trillion, uh, over 20 trillion of that is basically for developing countries and what we call, uh, the, whether it is our countries in the Gulf, uh, the countries in Asia. So the developing countries, including China, have basically around 20 trillion of that, uh, which is basically they are managing or they are in charge of. And mainly those two are in the uh, foreign exchange uh, reserves and the sovereign wealth fund side of things. So uh, just, just for example here, I mean, the, the largest, of course, by a long, long shot, uh, foreign exchange reserve holder is China, over $3.6 trillion today and followed by Japan. Uh, whilst the sovereign wealth fund, the largest, single largest, sing, single largest sovereign wealth fund is the Norwegian one, it's around 1.2 trillion. And then of course, it's followed by CIC, the China one, which is around 950 billion uh, dollars worth of uh, sort of sovereign wealth fund. And then we have the ideas of this world and the KIAs and the QIAs and Mobadilas and, and the rest will come after that. And then Hong Kong, and of course we have, Sing we have Singapore, Singapore we have two funds, uh, we have Temasek and we have the GIC. Uh, each of them are between 250 to 350 billion dollars. So these are the main sovereign wealth funds. And some of these, just the ones mentioned, are from commodity, which is the oil side. And one, some of them are from the uh, basically excess foreign, ex foreign exchange reserve, which they have deployed in investments for future nation. Now, what, what are the, well, the, the objectives, the main objectives of sovereign wealth funds are basically savings for, for, the, few, for the generations to come, okay? Uh, so it is savings, so that's why you do long-term investments uh, and, it, and it's, it's gotta be structured as long-term investments where the returns, you're not looking for high returns, but you're looking at sustainable returns on long-term basis because it's for the future. So you're investing your money today for the future generation. That's very important part. Then secondly is basically to fill in the deficits. So you have this and then whenever you have a deficit, you claw into this and bring it back to cover your deficit from year and year out 
uh, going to the future. Now, one thing about the Gulf, uh, because uh, from the Arab perspective, just to give you the, the Arab world, I'm not talking now uh, Middle East, I'm talking the Arab world, which basically covers the African Arab countries and the, and the Asian Arab countries. Between them, there is around, they have around $2.6 trillion of uh, sovereign wealth fund, or definition, defined sovereign wealth fund, of which around 70% of it is in the GCC. Okay. Uh, and the rest is basically covers more Libya, Algeria, <laughs> and the, the, main, the main two will come into that after that. So you have over 70%, which is GCC. And then, of course, the foreign exchange reserve, just again, out of the 12 trillion in the world, 1 trillion is in the Arab world, of which actually half of it is Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia has half of that uh, foreign exchange reserves. Uh, it is a, a Saud, Sa under Sama. We have around $515 million, billion dollars worth of foreign exchange reserves. Now, when, when we look at this, and especially looking at the GCC and the countries where are like Algeria, Libya, it's all to do with commodity. Now, what's been going on uh, this year and last year and looking to the future, it's very clear that we're going to be into a deficit years in the years to come in the GCC. Let me just be, let me, because they, these are the big ones. So it's in the GCC will be. So I, I just want to ask one, just before we dig into this, I have one question because you, you've, you've raised an important point that many uh, people didn't know, don't know, which is the difference between the f foreign reserves and the sovereign wealth fund that, that we know. Just quickly, what, in terms of investment or in terms of uh, placing the money, what is the different strategies of, of each? And usually is it, how is it coordinated? I know, for example, safe uh, in, in uh, the, the, the Chinese one uh, have certain uh, different uh, objectives than uh, CIC. Is it the same in the Arab world or is it yeah, blurred? I mean, uh, yeah, no, uh, well, uh, blur blurred is a good word, but let me be very clear. Um, let's, let's, let's have it as a, as a theme, okay? So most of the foreign exchange reserve, basically, it is what it is, it's foreign exchange money. And mostly it is in uh, treasuries, U.S. treasuries, okay? And that's one reason why China, okay, uh, China does not want, okay, the U.S. dollar to, to die for the time being, okay? Because China has so much money of its reserves in basically U.S. treasuries. So it does, doesn't want that. I mean, there's a lot of this, again, coming back to conspiracy theories, there's a lot of conspiracy that China's trying to basically kill off the American dollar. Um, maybe, maybe that is a strategy uh, for the next 30, 40 years, but it is not the strategy in the foreseeable uh, future, which is the next 10, 15 years. So I don't see that happening. So mostly of the foreign exchange reserves are in treasuries, okay, uh, which is supposed to be safe, Okay, uh, by although now soon it will be paying negative uh, uh, rates on it, ne negative interest. Okay, to keep your money safe. Whilst the sovereign wealth fund is more towards actually is as I said, it is for development, and you're looking at long term investments to create sustainability where you have income generated and you keep it going. A good example for this actually is KIA. KIA is a very good example. KIA. I mean, every year, uh, basically, all the, everything, which is the revenues minus all the budget expenditure, okay? If there is anything left goes into uh, the Global Reserve, Reserve Fund that they've created, which is owned by KIA, okay? So it goes there. And now every year, again, from that, okay, 10% uh, okay, of that income, Okay, or not income, that revenue, 10% of that net revenue goes to what is called future reserve fund, okay? And 10% of the income, okay, of the GRF for that particular year goes to the um, future reserve fund, which by law, nobody can touch the future reserve fund. You cannot claw money out of future reserve fund. So that, that is n nicely put from a perspective that there is a, from a governance perspective, they've done, KIA actually is one of the good examples from the governance perspective, okay? Uh, it, it runs very well. Now, an another issue which we should bring up because it's gonna come out, I've already actually got the question. I, I think there is somebody from uh, Asia um, 
who's just sent me here, is he, he, with you, but he sent me a, a direct question. And, and it has to do with, do, by definition, by definition, when you set up a sovereign world fund, you should not have, by definition, you should not have international debt. That was up to 2000, you should not have had international debt or very small amount of international debt. Now we see actually every, uh, every Jack and his friend basically are starting with sovereign wealth fund where they have substantial international debt. Now the two don't go hand in hand. You cannot be having international debt, okay, whilst you are having a sovereign wealth fund. You could have it, but it has to be small, small piece, very limited amount rather than being very, very high. But in certain countries, it's very, very high. They, the, the debt, international debt is high, whilst they have a sovereign wealth fund, which is much, much smaller than the international debt that they have. So that, that by definition, uh, it's, it, it doesn't make sense. It, it does Why not. not. I mean, if, if just, just, just a question. Today, running government expenditure, uh, infrastructure, whatever, you might want to take advantage of, like you mentioned, low interest rate or negative interest rate to, uh, uh, instead of using um, uh, your, your equity or, or your investment that are already placed in international market, doesn't it make sense to separate both? I mean, I understand that you have to have a, a, a good and proper governance of your own uh, public um, budget but why not have... Well, I'll I tell you why, I'll tell you why. Because most of the times, most of the time, the assets under the sovereign wealth fund, okay, they will be basically mortgaged to the creditors. That is, okay. that's, that's, one, that's one reason why. So what, what's happening, okay, now here you've got to differentiate different countries. We have three types of countries in the world, okay? We have state capitalist countries, such as China, and I would say China's alone in that, okay? And then you have what we call basically liberal democracies, okay, where the government is accountable to people. And we have then other countries where the governments are not accountable. Okay. We can have pictures saying government is accountable, government, but they are not accountable. Let's call a spade a spade now. What, what happens is that in the countries, you'll find actually most of the world, sovereign wealth funds, where they are in the countries where there is accountability to our parliament, accountability to the people, they are actually, they shy away from taking debt, totally shy away from taking debt. Or either it's by law, like Norway, it's by law, you cannot go and borrow, okay, as uh, the fund, however, as subsidiaries, some subsidies can borrow, depends on what it is. For argument, KIA is another one, where only subsidiaries were real estate, the real estate, that subsidiary can borrow money for that real estate, which makes sense from that perspective. But it cannot, they cannot go and borrow by and large. Then you have the, I mean, China. China actually, in its, its, its fund and CIC, it has a domestic arm and it has an international arm. The international arm I've not seen, they've not borrowed any money. Anymore. So they are very disciplined. The local one, and rightly so, they've borrowed because it's domestic. It's for purposes of doing, so you're developing the place, developing the country. So that I understand and they have, been, they have borrowed, okay, domestically. Now that makes sense. And then you have others where they borrow and it does not make sense. I mean, one of them actually, and I think here is why the question has come up. One good example is one MDB, okay, in Malaysia. Uh, when it started in 2008, the government gave it, uh, I think it was three billion uh, ringgits, okay, uh, as an endowment. And then by 2013, they had basically had around over 14, I think nearly 13 and a half billion dollars, okay, worth of debt, okay, which was on, on, on the book of one IMD, okay, uh, one MBD, where the government had to actually pay and service the, the debt around to, to the tune of 3 billion ringgits. And that which just started creating the problems that we've had and we are, well, we are still, that, that problem has not gone out. So, it does have those issues of problems once you start borrowing money as a sovereign wealth fund. So a sovereign wealth fund by definition should not be borrowing. It's subsidiaries, okay, should borrow if they want, but specific subsidiaries. So that, that is something that uh, it's an important point which has been raised and I think it's to come out. Now, let's come to the point of uh, what, what you mentioned about 
the region, okay? The region you have uh, one problem which is gonna be with you. Number one, all your money which is going to sovereign wealth fund, okay, is coming from two sides. It's coming from excess revenues minus budget uh, expenses, okay, which is basically from oil, plus the income on the funds that you already have, all right? Now, the two successful ones, and they will carry on being successful uh, in the foreseeable future, is KIA, okay, and ADIA, okay? So both are, because ADIA is the oil-based one, so it gets all, this, uh, all the income from the oil, and KIA is similar, it gets all the revenues minus the expenditure comes to it. Now, these two, just the return on their investments, although they've lost, I mean, they had a miserable year in 2018, they had a beautiful year in 2019. They're going to have a funny year in 2020. And, and we, going forward, these big players, okay, they will be doing okay from a return perspective. Okay. However, however, does this, because you, what you're going to see, you're going to see negative, sub, negative deficits uh, in the foreseeable future on the, all six countries in the Gulf, including Qatar. So you're going to have a negative uh, budget every year and that negative aspect somebody has to pay for that so where are they going to pay for that you're going to pay that out of two things either you're going to borrow money okay to pay for that or you're going to basically flop into your reserves and pay for it so what will happen uh, it's going to be and we we've already seen this it's a mixture saudi has done the mixture so they borrowed some money and they've clawed into the sama's money okay in its international foreign reserve into clawing some of that money back so we, they're doing that, but for how long, for how long these countries can carry on doing this? So there is a finite time, which then suddenly there is a problem. There is gonna be an issue coming sooner or later. Yes, 2.6 trillion, which is the total sovereign wealth fund of the Arab world, plus the 1 trillion uh, of foreign reserve, which is 3.6 trillion, it's a lot of money, but guess what? That a lot of money can go away very, very fast. Okay, if you don't spend it and deal with it in the right positioning. Now, governance aspect, I think here, because I like, I mean, the governance perspective, uh, Norway is a fantastic example. Uh, there is a very clear governance. The parliament uh, is re responsible eventually. It is a ministry of finance, but the, the parliament basically makes everybody accountable for what happens from an ethical investment, for how much invested in different places, from which companies they can invest in, which companies they cannot. So there is a list of companies that they cannot invest in, okay? Uh, year by year, they look into that and they deal with the same thing with uh, Singapore. They have a similar thing. Now, China, we don't know because it's all hidden. That's why the state capitalism works very well there. It's all hidden, okay? We don't, we don't see that. But what happens, and KIA has got some specific things, ADIA has specific things, but the rest actually, uh, they, they are basically uh, based on decision making, uh, abrupt decision making by someone and whoever is called chief executive, general manager, or whatever in those different organizations. Um, they have this big ego. Like, let's come back to the ego issue that we've spoken about so many times. They have so much ego. They are the big boys. But as soon as they get a phone call from the guy who's appointed them, they, they stand up even if nobody's in the room because they're so scared and they just basically follow put, 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 uh, put, 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 put money put money here and if the guy without questioning he will put money uh, there and I'm, i shouldn't be saying the guy the guy or the lady so they'll be putting the money wherever they've been told to put it so it is not sometimes unfortunately because you have this although most of the work is done properly okay it's done through doing a proper due diligence and everything else Unfortunately, because of this that you have on this side, okay, where it is by, done by an order, uh, everything then becomes questionable. So you, so you have that blurredy of the decision-making process in some sovereign wealth funds, which are very big sovereign wealth funds. They're not small, they're very, very big. Okay. Now, back, coming back to the commodity-based and non-commodity-based, non-commodity-based actually you can see the longevity of that. It can be with what's going on, with people going away uh, from uh, fossil fuels, people going away into alternative energy, people going to that. You find actually the, the countries such as China, 
Singapore, Korea, they will always, although, although it's not always the money comes in, but they will be in the future, they'll be having surpluses, whilst the countries which are based on commodity based alone, they will have a problem sooner or later because the income is going down and the expenditure is going up. So that's what they're going to be facing. And that is going to create a problem of the sovereign wealth fund itself as an asset. So we might see shrinking of the assets over a period of time. But the nice thing about it, the nice thing about sovereign wealth fund, because it is an intergenerational issue, it is something which is done for the future. It is not something that you invest in this today and you see it tomorrow. It is something that you, it is 20 years, 25 years down the road. Even if you have a bad management, okay, where they are not accountable per se to the parliament or to the people, uh, even if you bad management and the person who's appointed the bad management, unfortunately they get away with it because you can justify something like it is good. It's 20, I see what you guys don't see uh, approach. Okay, I am the one who sees, but you don't see approach, which, and, which unfortunately is kept, has got us into a lot of situ bad situations across the globe. And, and the Arab world, we are not no different from a lot of parts of the world. So that is a problematic issue that we're going to have. Now, that brings me to the point of when you asked me about the Sovereign Wealth Fund, I said, well, for me, a Sovereign Wealth Fund is not just Sovereign Wealth Fund alone. It is the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, let's just backtrack. In 2015, all the countries, all the, and when I say all the countries with capital, ALL, bold, italic, you name it, it's there. All countries signed, okay, the, what I call Vision 2030 of United Nations, which is basically eradicating sustainable development goals. 17 sustainable development goals. So basically clean up and fix things by 2030. Okay. A year later, a year later in Paris, okay, in Paris, everybody signed, or most of the people signed what is called the climate uh, uh, summit in Paris, okay, 2016. Yes, the biggest country in the world, 2017, got itself out, but everybody signed to the climate uh, perspective and absorbing the climate. Now, those two elements actually says a lot in terms of what needs to be done. So if I look at the UN, this is pure, I'm giving you UN numbers, UN, estimate that it will take five to seven trillion dollars worth of money to be invested, okay, to basically achieve the 17 sustainable, let's call them sustainable development goals, SDGs by 2030. Five to seven trillion. This five to seven trillion invested in that, okay, will create economic activity of around 12 trillion dollars be it in health, in education, in water, in, in cities, and everything, in all the different aspects of the 17 uh, SDGs. Okay. So that will be achieved, I will achieve it $12 trillion, and it will create 380 million jobs by 2030. Now, this is UN's numbers. Now, backtrack in terms of sovereign wealth fund, because you got to look at where is the money going to come from for this. So by definition, most of the SDGs are long-term things that you're going to be dealing with. Now, there are three types of SDGs. There are the social ones, okay? Uh, and, and they are the most important. That's why no poverty is number one, okay? And then you have zero hunger, you have quality education, you have reduced inequalities, and you have peace, okay? Uh, and justice and strong institutions, okay? And you have the gender equality. Now, these are the social ones, okay? Now, when you look, when you think about investing in these, it's very easy for middle management and top management in a sovereign wealth fund because of the objective of sovereign wealth fund, the savings for the future, to say these are very high risk investments, okay? To achieve number one because it's not something that you can catch you can say okay now i invest so much money because of this hunger goal i will put money into this uh, what's the return i'm going to get coming back to your point about return what return i'm going to get so it's very easy to say no to it okay 
So that's, those are the social ones. Then you have the other ones, okay? And the main other ones here is good health, okay? Which is an important, important thing. And affordable and clean energy, okay? And infrastructure. Th those are three very important ones from an investment. All those three are long-term investments, okay? The return on it is not overnight. It's a long-term return, okay? But there is a return coming to you. So you can quantify the return on something like that. Now, how much money as of today has been spent by sovereign wealth funds worldwide on green, okay, on green, what I would call green energy, okay, it's less than 1% of the total 8 point something, $8.5 trillion, less than 1% of that has gone into green energy. Now, when we look, now let's back, backtrack again, because it's all about logic here. If you've signed as governments, because whether we like it or not, all these sovereign wealth funds, okay, even the ones which are controlled by parliaments, okay, all of them, all these countries have signed to the SDGs in 2015, okay, which is the 2030 UN vision for the SDGs. Everybody's signed. Now, it's very easy from perspective. What you do is to say, okay, we should now increase our investments and in infrastructure we should increase our investments and in clean energy we should increase to, and and here just to give an example um uh, mabadala for argument's sake and they make a big song and dance of it and rightly so through its subsidiary master okay they've spent over 12.5 billion okay can you hear me yes yes we can hear you okay okay yeah okay they've spent over 12.5 uh, billion dollars okay and basically green energy sign, but out of, out of $230 billion, which, which is actually a good number from uh, Mubadala. But we need more of that from most of the country. And we need more of the ones which are basically sustainability in terms of cities, in terms of uh, education and all that. And we do not see real investment. Just to give you an example, again, as a, as a negative side, what happens is that uh, certain countries or certain sovereign wealth funds are very clear in their, what they can invest in and what cannot they invest in, like Norway, like KIA, okay? Like ADIA used to be, it's a bit changed now, but not that much. Still, let's say ADIA is very, very clear in its investment policy, the way it does things, okay? That what happens is that when you want um, as a person in charge of the managing person, okay, and you want to have a signature investment. Now, what's a signature investment? Signature investment is basically puts you on the map, be it a football team, be it uh, uh, a hotel which has got your name to it, be it something which is basically a signature. Thing. Now, is a signature investment all the time, yes, sometimes it works, but all of the time, most of the time it does not work, is it actually achieving the goals of the sovereign wealth fund? Is it achieving the goals of the future generations? I think the simple answer to that is no, okay? However, that happens. I always say, why do you do it through a sovereign wealth fund? Do it outside. I mean, you are in charge, you are in control of everything. So rather than putting it under sovereign wealth fund, put it under something else. You can take money from here, put it there, nobody will ask any questions most of the times, okay? So it, it, it's a mistake and, and it becomes a big mistake when you are a signatory to something like the SDGs, the Vision 2030, and you invest your money in non-green, matter of fact, which goes totally against the green energy, okay? You are just going totally the other way around. I mean, it's, 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 we say it's bad if you don't invest in green, but it's extremely bad if you invest in something which is totally going against the green, okay? So what happens is that we are putting a lot of investment into what I call signature investment, and it creates a problem for certain. If, if, if guess, signature, by the way, I, sig, I, sig, I sig, signature ask, uh, There's two questions I'd like to ask. I think you raise an extremely important point: is that uh, I mean, let's let's call call things how how they are. I mean, when you mention a football club, you're talking about recently FII and the negotiations to buy a a, a UK-based football club, but Saudi Arabia has an objective of uh, introducing sports, introducing entertainment, introducing 
uh, a full generation and to also taking part into these activities and these new jobs of whether it's e-gaming, whether it's e so why today, even if it's a signature, and, and I see what you mean, why not buy a football club with uh, the, uh, uh, sorry, I, uh, PIF, I, I used the wrong name, uh, with uh, PIF money, it's, it's 300 million, it, I think the deal was, which is uh, fell apart now, but it's, it's not much and it can go into any, I mean, any of the, 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 the objectives that they are taking into opening their uh, population and their young population to sports, to entertainment, to new things that were missing uh, before. If it, and, and sorry, I mean, I just want to add something. If you look at from the other side of it, if you look at MISC, for example, they are promoting, doing programs into uh, the, bit, the, the, the jobs uh, of sports and how to manage a sports club and how to manage, uh, have a, a sports career. So why don't we, why couldn't this be uh, like a, 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 a two birds with one stone? A signature no. deal, but in the okay. same time, you are also uh, bringing something I, I, to your, I, your as, population. As, 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 as I said, as I said, okay. And, and actually you bring an example, which is an exception to the rule. Okay. Now, PIF deal, okay, which as you said, fell through. Uh, for we, we don't want to know the reasons and we are not interested in it, but it fell through. To the contrary, I'll come to the point, which is an interesting thing from a Saudi perspective. Sa Saudi is an interesting part in all this, okay? Uh, and actually that brings me, I'll, I'll bring the, the point that you're raising towards the end as a, from just to respond to your question, is that when we look at the rate of unemployment in the Arab world today, okay, the rate of unemployment for the youth, for the people, up to the age of 25, okay? On average, on average, across the Arab world, is 31%, 32%, okay? People up to the age of, and this is pre-COVID-19, okay? God, God knows what's gonna be the number post-COVID-19, but pre-COVID-19, the number is around 32% people under the age of 25. I'm not interested in the people above that because they're already other than working or whatever, but I'm looking at the people at that age because they are the, they're going to the future. It's less than, it's around 32%, okay? And I always laugh at these numbers everywhere in the world when I look at it, because the numbers are as good as the person who's feeding the numbers in, okay? And to be honest, when I looked at the Arab world, okay, and I, I know the numbers in most of the countries, okay, uh, and the only one I could say it was genuine, as good as genuine number was the Saudi number. Because the Saudis actually did come and say, okay, we have this gap. And Mohammed bin Salman himself, actually, he came, I remember, and when he launched the Vision 2030, he did say the issue, the problem, the unemployment, and the gender, lack of gender equality. He, those are two important things that came out in Saudi. So Saudi has a, a separate thing, and I always say the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, but to, to have that, you've just started. So you've just started giving the gender equality a chance. You just started doing, th you just started saying, okay, I want to be not dealing with oil anymore. Unfortunately, like today, the results of Aramco, Aramco's results, I mean, because of this COVID-19 has shown how bad it is, okay? Because of, la of, of loss of resources, which by the way, has an issue here. It's a, se a second issue, which I'll come to, okay? So Saudi has an interesting thing. So Saudi, when they took a decision, which is a global decision, we want to expand in different areas. Okay? It's a different thing than somebody coming in and because he likes a team, okay, be it football team, be it any other type of team, and he likes it, and he goes basically and buys it through the sovereign wealth fund. So I, let's differentiate the two. Okay? But then this Aramco numbers, because Aramco is the largest company by a long, long shot, okay? Uh, I mean, it's one of the largest companies in the world, but it's the largest company by a long shot in the Arab world. Now, mm -hmm. remember what we said about the reserves, okay, the foreign reserves. Saudi has around 515, now it's around 400 and something because it, it's been depleted, okay? Now, because you are picked to the dollar, remember this, now the Gulf countries are picked to the dollar. Another problem that the Gulf country is gonna have, when, 
what, what's the currency? A currency is supported by the economy. Okay? When the economy is in trouble, your currency by definition should go down. Now, the only way you're gonna support your currency is by spending your reserves because you have sufficient reserves. So there is reserves which we don't know the numbers, but it should soon numbers will start coming out. How much money, okay, the GCC countries are spending out of the reserves to maintain the pegging to the dollar, okay? Knowing, knowing that they will not be where they were, they are gonna be depleting in terms of the income, except when Saudi, and Saudi is the largest, okay? If it really diversifies okay, the way the Vision 2030 talks, terms of implementation and diversifying the economy to the extent of covering that issue. So we have these things that all of this comes together. Now, coming back to SDGs. Now, SDGs, when, when we talk about 31% unemployment in the Arab world for people below the age of 25, pre-COVID-19, the number, okay? Now, how do you create jobs? Now, most of the sovereign wealth funds, when we look across the globe today, a lot of investments are going where? They're going to technology, okay? They're going to life sciences, okay? They're going to things like that. And where is the technology? Where is the life sciences? It is United States, it is China, it is India, it is Singapore, okay? It is not the Arab world, okay? Where are most of the VCs? See, the biggest players in the VCs today, venture capital, okay? And of course, the soft bank uh, fund of 100 billion, it was the one which came out and everybody now, everybody who didn't know anything about venture capital understands what venture capital is all about because of 100 billion. Okay. Now, when you look at 2018 and 2019, how much money, venture money, venture money, okay, which has gone into the US, India, China, whatever, okay, you'll find actually nearly 10 to 12% of that money is coming from sovereign wealth funds, which it is good, in a way, but, but, okay, when, when you go into startups, when you go to seed, when you go to seed money, when you go to series A, series B, whatever, into investments in the venture, in the venture world, the chances of success is, yeah, I mean, you, you always, one or two hit and you make big money and few, like Uber went negative for PIA for argument's sake, uh, okay. Uh, we work went negative, but then they've got other ones, okay, Slack and other ones, which went positive. So you're going to give the positive and negative, and you hope eventually that the positives will outbe the negatives, and you make around three to four times your money, okay, eventually in 10 years down the road. Now, the point is spending, especially in the Arab world, investing in the infrastructure and the green energy and education and health which would create, number one, jobs, okay? Number two, it will create sustainable development across the Arab world, and I'm talking Arab world now, okay, across the Arab world. And rather than going and buying, saying for food security, I go and buy uh, land in Sudan because it's fertile, that's a stupid way of doing it. I, it's much better that I go and co-invest and develop there and create jobs, okay? And I have a share in that, okay? It's much better than going buying pieces of land, which eventually by they will be nationalized, taken over by whoever is going to be coming in the government. So, Khalid, I, I, I want to raise on these points because you, you, you've, you've, uh, uh, you, you're, you're putting on a, a very important thing, which is the, the asset class, the, the, the breakdown of asset class. And whether you talk about sovereign wealth funds or you talk about even university endowments, usually the biggest chunk of their investment which can reach even 60% is in developed equities. Uh, and you look at private equity and venture capital that you mentioned, usually it does not go, Yale changed it a little bit, but it doesn't go above, let's say, 8% private equity, including uh, venture capital and, and the rest. So even when you talk about one, uh, uh, investing in, uh, in making sure it's, uh, SDG, you're as good as the companies in which you invest. So you can do some, some statements and say, we won't invest in, uh, in uh, look, stocks look, look, that um, look, respect SDG. Carla, Just one let, second. Let, 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 no, no, let, I, I, I will ask you my no, question. No. Ask you. So, so when you talk about the Arab world and the amounts that they have, how much of these, uh, I mean, then you, what you're suggesting is to 
change completely the con concept of a sovereign wealth fund for our region and to focus in a total, total different way. No, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm saying to something totally different. I'm saying, by definition, sovereign wealth funds are intergenerational funds. They are long-term. Okay. Now, fine, I, I sit in a, in a small little country and I put all my money outside in the United States and in China and in Singapore and in India, okay? My question is, that's okay, but for Singapore to do that, that's different, okay, than someone like in the Arab world doing that. In Singapore, they've already developed the system so well in their own country, they've reached the point of maturity, okay? They're a developed country, they can do that. They have the excess, so the excess is going out. So they have the best health, they have the best education, they have best everything, the best infrastructure, everything is the best. And the rate of unemployment is as good as zero in that country. Okay. So they can afford to put money outside and take some risk and some money in terms of private equity or alternative investments, such as venture capital. And venture capital is going to be more of the norm in the future. Right? Okay. So they're going to be putting more money into that. Now, when you come to small to other countries, where let's take the Arab world, the Arab world, just look at the Arab world. I've just said we have 31 to 32% unemployment. Level. How good is that you are spending your money and giving it to American companies or investing it in stock markets and wherever, in Shanghai, in Japan, whatever? Well, it okay. is my understanding that Norway doesn't invest in, in their local market. The, 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 no, no, no. Nor Nor all Norway, the investment Nor of the sovereign wealth fund are, have to be outside so that it doesn't impact negatively the local market because there's another point is like sorry uh, yeah, Khalid, no, but, but, but no but, but Khalid, don't compare excuse my language here don't compare yourself with norway norway is the same as singapore not, i'm norway, i'm grown with blue eyes as well no, no. Huh? norway norway is like singapore it's a developed country okay they are fully matured countries they are matured in every aspect okay i'm sorry with all due respect to all our countries in the arab world we are far away from maturity for just to give you another example, there is an important example. The reason we don't actually invest in ourselves, okay? There, is a main, there are two important reasons. Reason number one, as much as we have, we're always gonna come back to as much as we have, as much as we have, good laws written everywhere. When it comes to implementation, we are as bad as the worst, okay? When it comes to implementation of the law. So since you have, and it always comes back to the point of, from a legal redress, when you have somebody above the law, there is no law. That's number one. Number two is trust. Okay? We do not trust each other. So when we, when we look at this, okay, uh, it, it creates a problem. I'm, what I'm trying to say is rather than, uh, I mean, just use the points. I mean, if five, this is the United Nations, five to seven trillion across the globe is required, across the globe, okay, to basically achieve, achieve, the full SDGs by 2030. How much are we talking about the Arab world? In that? Shall we say 10%? Let's say it's 10%. 10% is the Arab I'd world. Say that. Just, no, no, no I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a bit sort of uh, rough, okay? 10%. So we're talking about $500 billion to $700 billion of investing in that. Why don't we think in the SDG terms? of investing, rather than investing in arms, rather than investing, we talk about Lebanon, I mean, Lebanon is, rather than investing and in giving it to a warlord to keep status quo here or keep status quo there, okay? Why don't we invest in the SDGs, 500 to 700 billion? These are not my numbers. I'm not good with numbers. These are United Nations numbers. And if any country believe the United Nations number no, wrong, they should not be part of the United Nations. Okay. So we need, actually, we need, we need to work on the SDGs across the globe. But if you don't do it at the country level, if you don't do it at the regional level, okay, nobody's going to do it. And we, since we have nearly $3.7 trillion okay, worth of this sovereign wealth funds and excess money that we have in reserves, rather than investing it, because some of it will go towards basically keeping us going. But we need to invest in the SDGs in order that we create jobs, in order that we have what Saudi is trying to do. I mean, I, mean, I tell you. I, mean, I, mean, I just want to interrupt you, Khalid. Sorry. I mean, I, 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 I personally do not like, I mean, what I'm seeing is quite the opposite. I mean, I do not like to see 
sovereign wealth funds pour money into the economy. Uh, what I want to see is government putting a proper regulation that supports the private sector to do good businesses. I don't want to see, I mean, if, if you yeah, start but, pouring but Khaled, into... Khaled, 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 just one second, just Khaled, one second. Khaled, Khaled, if you start Khaled, seeing let, sovereign let, wealth let, fund let, money go let, into let me, and compete me, with the private sector, there's no way you're going to have Khaled. one single private sector no. company. Everybody's no. out. No, no. One, 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 one goal, one goal, actually, one goal is basically reduced inequalities. One goal, okay, which is goal number 10, reduced inequalities, okay. Now that actually, when you go a bit further on reducing inequalities, when you talk about the Arab world, let's take, to give me any country, okay, who manages the business in that particular country. The GCC countries are run by governments, whether we like it or not, okay. They're run by the governments. The governments run the show, yes, all of them and their visions, they want to basically give more towards the private sector, but to give the private sector, okay, the private sector has to, 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 to dig into this. And that's why I come back to the point of the yes sir man, you know, he sits there, he's in charge of a sovereign wealth fund. He only, he does two things. He does a good job by doing little things that he does by checking things. And the worst thing he does is by getting a phone call saying, put money here and he puts money there. Okay, I'm sorry, that, that is not going to create anything for you. What I'm trying to say is in order to do the SDGs, private sector cannot do SDGs okay, and invest in SDGs without the government putting their input into that, especially in the countries like our countries. Now in Egypt, if, if the army is totally out of the business and everything is allowed to, to private sector, hey, Yes, you're right. It will flourish. Would that happen? I do not see that happening. You know. So the same thing in any country in the Gulf. Is the government going to take its hands off everything? I do not see that happening. Okay, you're right. I mean, how much? How much is the investment of Adia in the stock market in Abu Dhabi and Dubai? It's peanuts, and rightly so, peanuts, because there is no need to have that. Okay, Mabadal is a bit higher, but Adia doesn't have that much, and it doesn't have to have that much. Okay. But what I'm saying is that is the other side is that we do not create jobs. We do not have the green energy coming through to us. We do not have clean water to us. We do not have food security to us, proper food security. That everything you're talking about is going to go out of the window. So we need to think the SDG, which is basically, it, it's, it's two, I break it into two, sustainable social development goals and sustainable infrastructural development goals, okay? So you need to, to invest in those two in order that you're gonna have a brighter future for yourself, okay? And utilizing the sovereign wealth funds, I'm not saying inv invest all of it, I'm saying part of it, because you are, by the way, investing, whether you like it or not, you're investing in green technology, okay? In China and investing in the United States. You are investing in things elsewhere and the infrastructure, you know, you're not investing in yourself. Like we have with that, I mean, I'm, get, I'm getting, by the way, on this, I'm getting so many messages and what, there's somebody- Khalid, I, I, I speaking of messages, I have a, a question for you. Uh, it's, when are we gonna trust each other and launch a green SDG Silicon Valley in Dubai or any other place in the world? When? Well, that, 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 there's a question. It's like, that, when that, are we no, going that, to launch? That, that, no, no, that, 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 look, that is going to happen. Not, it's not going to happen because it is done for the right reason. It's going to happen for lip service. Okay. I tell you, a lot of sovereign wealth funds, and some of them, I see them on, 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 on the names here now with you. Okay. Some of the people who work on sovereign wealth funds, they've opened up. They've opened up. Okay. In, in, in San Francisco offices, in London offices, in Singapore offices, everywhere offices. By the way, these are Asian and Arab sovereign wealth funds. They've opened up offices everywhere. Okay. One thing they have not done actually is looking inwards in terms of improving things from within. I would say, you, you, I mean, here brings me back to the Saudi side. Saudis actually, what they're trying to do is to manage that and it's going to be, it's, it's transitional and, and, the, and the transition is not going to be easy. We're going to have problems and we're going to have losses, but we're going to have gains, but they're going to learn from that transition. The good thing about it, okay, part of the SDGs actually 
Saudi is already working ahead of everybody else because it started late. It started late, I think. So it's starting to come through. It's get, trying to give opportunities in terms of the gender side, in terms of the equality factor. You know, it's trying to bring that in. But mm -hmm. it's not going to be cheap. It's not going to be easy. That's why everybody got upset with Jadan, Minister Jadan, when he came up with his 15% VAT and everything else, which, by the way, personally, I think it's wrong. But they, they have their reasons why they did it that way. And, and the reason is because they are looking at this transition period, which is going to be tough, but they're going to start creating jobs. Coming back to the point of having uh, a green energy, we're, we already have. Masdar okay, is doing that. Okay, substantial mm -hmm. amount of money has been invested there. So it's doing that. But is that enough? My answer to that is no. I mean, you need substantially much, much more than that. You need, you need to look across the Arab world, okay? Since we always, they look, they, the, the rest of the world looks at us as one, we need to deal with this as one, sooner or later. Khalid, I, I, so if anybody has questions, if anybody wants to ask a live question, they can raise their hand and we, they can speak, we'll, we'll all, uh, open uh, the, the floor to them and they can ask their question uh, through voice if they want. We have another uh, question because we like have five to 10 minutes left. Uh, what is the main goal of uh, the sovereign wealth funds? Uh, uh, future reserves for use in bad time or economic support? Well, so sovereign wealth fund globally, uh, they are for two things. Uh, that are, number one, for savings. So you're saving your excess money for the future. Okay. And number two, actually, you're saving uh, for future generation. And number two, you're saving for whenever you're going to have economic problems, macroeconomic problems, and you need for stimulus, you need to play for your budget to fix your budget because of deficits, you're going to have it for that. So I would say those are the two main reasons, although there is the third one, but it's not in our part of the world, nor it is in Asia. It is more actually uh, European and, and North American, and that is thinking of the pensions for the future in terms of liabilities, like the Norway one. We have a, a live question, so uh, I will, I, I will, we will uh, let, let them speak. So, uh, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, my question to my friend uh, Khalid is that, uh, how do you see the UAE's really uh, policy or uh, investments uh, in regards to their use of their uh, sovereign wealth? Uh, and, uh, and how about Qatar as well? Do you think these two countries are doing well? Uh, or no, they are like some of the other Arab countries. Thank you. All right. Well, I mean, U UAE, I mean, UAE is Abu Dhabi. In reality, it's Abu Dhabi. Okay. Uh, Dubai has uh, what we call the uh, investment corporation of Dubai, uh, basically around 240 billion of worth of assets, but a lot of that is borrowed money too there. But, Abu Dhabi is the main one. When we look at Abu Dhabi, we're looking at between the two main ones because now Mubadala has taken over Addict, so uh, it's merged into Mubadala. Between the two, we're talking about basically here $800 billion. Now, $800 billion for Abu Dhabi, and then forget Abu Dhabi, let's look at UAE altogether. That $800 billion worth of assets under management uh, and Abu Dhabi and UAE, because of people-wise, we're talking about maximum a million people here as, as indigenous population. And when we look at the income uh, generated year in, year out, and on average, and we, let's look at Adia, on average, we're talking about $40 billion a year. Uh, that will maintain UAE for a long time to come. The only issue with that is, is that because of the deficits which are going to come into the future and because of deficits of the neighbors in the future because Abu Dhabi or the Emirates or Abu Dhabi without other Emirates is going to be an issue so Abu Dhabi has to sustain other Emirates at the same time the Emirates have to be basically careful with countries the neighboring countries so they need to maintain that going plus then you have other investments which have been done in the past which are not investments per se they are influential investments supporting other countries okay now is that going to carry on i think it will carry on for the next two to three years but then after that i think 
countries in the Arab world and elsewhere have to look elsewhere to get support because this money will be needed for inside and to maintain things as the, the question which was earlier about where the money goes to the sovereign wealth fund is to basically support stimulus aspect of the macroeconomics and the deficit so you need to cover it up so i would say emirates is doing well from perspective of investments now mubadala is a bit different mubadala maybe it's a bit different than adia mubadala is taking much totally different types of risk uh, perspective than adia is uh, they're going into venture they're going into alternative investments and going into green technology too so uh, I don't see much of an issue for UAE in the foreseeable future. They will carry on being okay, but they have the big picture of the countries surrounding them and the future problems with the energy being much, much cheaper than what it is today. As QIA is concerned, QIA has been, uh, it's the one that you don't see much. I mean, even when I was looking at how much debt they've raised, you don't see uh, much of that through, but I'm sure they've raised debt uh, as QIA. And I'm always someone who's, uh, for our countries in the GCC, I think it's wrong to raise, to raise debt uh, as a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, you can raise it as companies owned by sovereign wealth fund, but not the sovereign wealth fund themselves, because eventually it will affect, it'll affect the country. Luckily, there is no political damage there because there is no accountability per se. Uh, but QIA, uh, again, if, if Emirates is around a million, uh, Qatar is around 250,000 people. So from the income alone generated, that, that's sufficient to keep everybody happy in the foreseeable future. But for how long, uh, because of the countries surrounding it, I don't see uh, what I would call sustainability. And, that. and sustainability is not in terms of investing in uh, basically buying land in Sudan and saying this is for food security. That doesn't work that way. Great. Uh, we, we don't have any more questions, just one question on Lebanon, but we, we will keep it for maybe a, we do a special session on, on Lebanon. Uh, Khalid, thank you very much for once again uh, sharing uh, all these insights uh, uh, with us. Uh, thank you very much for all the attendees that, that were there and uh, looking forward to our next.